It's an enormous pleasure to welcome the renowned economist Darren Ajimolu. Uh, he is Elizabeth and James Killian Professor of Economics at MIT. And um, his fields of interest um, include um, such, um, I mean, from a philosopher's perspective, uh, such very sort of close fields as political economy, um, uh, um, in income and wage inequality, uh, and development, and labor economics, uh, and many more fields. Um, he's uh, author and co-author uh, of a number of books. Let me just mention uh, the two he's co-authored with uh, James uh, Robinson. Um, one is from 2006, entitled Economic Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy, uh, and um, possibly uh, one uh, you already know of, uh, it's one I've read. Um, it's why, uh, from 2012, uh, Why Nations Fail, uh, Origins of Power, Poverty, and Prosperity. So uh, Darren's work takes up central challenge challenges for social science, and these, I take it, should also be uh, central challenges for social ontology. Um, pleasure to have you here, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's my first social ontology uh, conference. I hope it's not the last one, but you'll decide that. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, a new book that James Robinson and I are working on, uh, hopefully uh, close to completion, but you know, with these things, you never know. And the title, until the publishers decide we cannot have this title, is The Narrow Corridor to Liberty, The Red Queen and the Struggle of State Against Society. So what the heck does that mean? So that's the first mystery. Uh, so uh, let me try to answer that one, except that, where did that go? Oh yeah, here it is. All right, so what do we mean by liberty? So that's one word. Uh, so we're gonna follow a philosopher actually, uh, Philip Pettit, uh, who defines uh, in uh, several books uh, the notion of dominance, the, uh, the overwhelming power of one individual or group over another individual or group. To live at the mercy of another, having to live in a manner that leaves you vulnerable to some ill that the other is in a position to arbitrarily impose. And we're going to define liberty as the lack of dominance, or more generally, freedom from violence, threat of violence, and dominance. And the key question of the book, in some sense, is how societies achieve or fail to achieve liberty, and the fail to achieve is actually easier to start with, so that's where I'm gonna start from. So this is uh, uh, courtesy of uh, Freddy Papazian there, who uh, has been helping me uh, over the summer. It's the first animation I've ever had in a slide, uh, and the second one will come later, so it's very impressive. Uh, so this is the city of Raqqa, how it looks like, uh, under or shortly after the Islamic State. Uh, so this is not a situation of liberty. It's a complete chaos, and people have lived and suffered greatly under the, uh, uh, under the repression and murders and, uh, and, and, uh, and dominance of the Islamic State, and, uh, and some of the visible signs are there, but uh, non-visible signs are the huge numbers of people who've left Raqqa during this period from the fear that they will be further subject to violence. Similarly, in uh, Mosul, Iraq, you see the same thing, although it says Syria, that's Iraq. Uh, and uh, again, uh, fear, violence, dominance of all sorts. But how did we get here? Well, the way you get here is very uh, nicely summarized by this picture. Both in Iraq and Syria, the uh, state institutions, in particular the state's ability to enforce laws, control violence, have completely collapsed. So these are helmets left by Iraqi soldiers as they were fleeing uh, Islamic State warriors. So one uh, very well understood sort of set of cases discussed by political scientists is that anything approaching liberty or freedom from violence or the threat of violence is pretty difficult to achieve in a society where there are no laws or no laws enforced by some source of state institutions. 
But of course, violence and huge migration flows because of fear of violence are not restricted to the Middle East. In fact, the largest refugee camp in the world is not in Lebanon, uh, in, next to Syria, or in Turkey, uh, getting people from Iraq and Syria, uh, or anywhere else, but it's actually in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Bangladesh, in the Cox Bazar, almost one million people. And those are the ones fleeing from the Rakhine state, uh, the Rohingya Muslim fleeing Rakhine state in, in Myanmar. But the difference of this particular refugee crisis and the huge amount of fear that the Rohingya Muslim have actually suffered, not just you know, the last two years, but actually for several decades, is that it is in the hands of the state. The uh, uh, ethnic cleansing of the Rohingya Muslim that led to over one million people uh, leaving the the Rakhine state, uh, about 900,000 of them in the Cox Bazar, uh, it was very much designed, orchestrated, partly implemented by the army, the most powerful arm of the, uh, of the, uh, of the Myanmar state. But this is not a, uh, uh, this is not a uh, uh, sort of an exceptional case. You know, a much more capable state, which I'll talk a little bit more about later on, China, which has the power uh, to implement things that probably the Myanmar government could not even dream of, actually also has a huge amount of dominance and uh, threat of violence over its citizens. So these are the uh, locations of uh, the Logai uh, la labor ca camps. Uh, this is uh, one type of labor camp that China has. Another one are the re-education through labor camps. The other one are simple detention camps. Uh, uh, that, that are uh, mostly in the Xinjiang province for Uyghur, Uyghur Muslims. Overall, probably all, uh, around 6 million people are in these forced labor camps. And, uh, and this is just one type of dominance, but it's not only this, the only one, but uh, you know, the ability of the, the very high ability of the Chinese state also translates into all kinds of other ways for the state to be able to dominate people. So one of them is the uh, uh, social credit system that has uh, in its uh, uh, nascent form being implemented where the state is going to be able to uh, monitor all of your activities, including all of your social media activities and, uh, and any other kind of other undesirable behavior and then be able to ration, for example, apartments or permits or any other kinds of uh, access to uh, government services or other things, but possibly also whether you get a ticket to one of these re-education through labor camps. So, uh, so this is uh, then sort of raising a particular kind of conundrum, which is that when we don't have state, uh, we have anything. We have nothing approaching liberty because, in the absence of the state being able to enforce laws and protect people, there are going to be groups like Islamic State, uh, whether they call them Islamic State or whatever else they call, they're going to be able to use violence and the threat of violence and impose their own wishes and, uh, and various different kinds of dominance. But when you have the state, it's going to be the despotic dominance of the state where in various different forms, whether it takes the more violent naked form as in the Myanmar Rakhine state or the softer form uh, of the social credit system, that doesn't look like liberty. And in fact, this is uh, a very well understood problem in history. It is probably in the first written tablets that it is get, gets captured. And so that's why you might want to call it the Gilgamesh problem. The Sumerian tablets surviving from about 4,000 years ago tell the story of Gilgamesh, the king of Uruk, who created a rich, secure, and powerful city. And looks like the kind of city that you would want to build your liberty and non-dominance on. See how its ramparts gleam like copper in the sun. Wonderful places, wonderful uh, infrastructure, uh, very high levels of uh, uh, beauty and uh, the sort of infrastructure on which the, uh, the, the, the sort of economic flourishing was taking place. But there was a particular fly in the ointment, which is not un, uh, unlike what we have seen with the state's behavior in the Myanmar case or the Chinese case, despotism. The, uh, the tablets continue, who is like Gilgamesh, what other king has inspired such awe? Who else can say, I alone rule supreme among man mankind? So he's uh, sort of able to do anything, trampling its citizens like a wild bull. He is king. He does whatever he wants. 
He takes the son from his father, crushes him, takes the girl from her mother, and uses her. No one dares to oppose him. So that pretty much sounds like Pettit's definition of dominance. So again, despotism. But what's sort of very interesting about uh, the, 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 the Sumerian tablets of Uruk is that they also come up with the first solution. So the citizens are sick of uh, Gilgamesh, so they cry to heaven, to the, 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 the god of the sky, to Anu, to stop his despotism. So Anu comes up with the first uh, solution to contain Gilgamesh. So he, uh, sh uh, he gets to create, a, or another god, to create a double for Gilgamesh. And uh, his second self, Amon, a man who equals his strength and courage, and, uh, and it's going to find this, in, uh, and Diktu, and Kidu is going to find Gilgamesh. So this is an idea of checks and balances. And uh, in the story, actually, Enkidu and Gilgamesh fight, fight for, for a very long time. And, uh, and, and uh, actually, they draw. I say it beats him, but uh, it contains, Enkidu contains him. And uh, you have a sort of solution, a checks and balances solution. But this uh, doppelganger solution create a double, a, another part of the institutional structure to balance the power, the despotism of the state. Well, that's a little impractical in general, even though it's very greatly favored by political scientists and philosophers. You know, it involves this sort of fighting, but even more probably, the problem is that, you know, who will control, control Enkidu? Actually, in the continuing uh, tablets, Enkidu and Gilgamesh gang up. So who's going to prevent the checks and balances to turn into a different kinds of despotism? So in fact, despite all that's written about checks and balances, this book is about something quite different and, uh, and, and in fact explicitly about checks and balances not being such a great solution in and of itself without this other thing. And this is what we're going to call shackling the Leviathan. So it's much better, we're going to argue, if citizens, those who are suffering the despotism, do the controlling the despot. So that's what we're going to call shackling the Leviathan, and this is going to sort of going to be a much better solution for not a perfect solution either, and some problems of it are going to come through as we, as we go uh, over them soon. But this is going to be the solution that we advocate, not just as a normative thing, but as actually a positive one, as the one that has emerged most often in society. Once the Leviathan is shackled, its relationship to citizens is going to change. And in the process, and this is going to be the key of the, what we're going to call the Red Queen, uh, there is going to be a dynamic relationship of empowerment of both state and society, and a very different type of politics. So just to give you an inkling of that, here is another uh, picture. Uh, this is uh, <clears throat> in Germany. Before the refugees were allowed into Germany, people demonstrating in the street. And what's uh, remarkable about this is two things that is very, would have been very strange to most people uh, until perhaps you know, 200 years ago, which is that people Ordinary people, non-elites, people don't have, who don't have any special economic or political power, are organizing and trying to put pressure on state institutions, but not in order to sort of get the state institutions to do, to, uh, not to do something or to do something special for them, but for the state institutions to actually act and take on more responsibility. So the citizens are actually calling for the state to do something. And this is not a unique phenomenon, for example, here in Colorado, people walking in the streets uh, asking the, uh, the government to implement environmental regulations. Good luck with that. But you know, again, people at least feel they can do that. Uh, those are all examples in which society is organizing in order to ask the state to do something. And that is actually what I mean by this transformed nature of politics. This looks very different from what people of Uruk would have realized or would have thought about, because the key is for not a uh, sort of a checks and balances condition, but a condition in which people are able to organize and, as a result, actually get the state to do more things. So now, schematically, this is what I have in mind. And uh, this is a very great abstraction, but one that sort of works for what I want to talk about. So on the horizontal axis, I put the power or capability of society. On the vertical axis, 
I have the power or the capacity of the state. And uh, here, in this region, this may not work, but that's okay. Here, in this region here, we have the state being too weak relative to the, uh, to the ability of the society to undo what the society wants or develop other uh, ways of implementing whatever certain groups in society want to do. So this will be, I'll talk about the Tiv in a second, or the uh, Syria after Islamic State, where the, or Iraq after Islamic State, where state institutions largely collapse. So here, what we're going to call the despotic leviathan is China, where society is no match for the power of the state. So the state can put them in jail, get them to do what it wants, monitor them, uh, weaken civil society further. So what we're calling the shackling of the Leviathan, shackled Leviathan is in this narrow area. And because that area looks like a corridor, hence the narrow corridor to liberty. And what's uh, represented by the arrows there is how the powers of state and society evolve. So here, for reasons I'm going to talk about, not only you start with relative weakness of the state, but unless certain other factors shock things away from this area, and there are many factors that might, and I'll talk about some of them in a second, you're going to have further weakening of political hierarchy and the ability of the state to impose its will, especially its despotic will. Here, you know, what the social credit system is all about is weakening society further so that it is no challenge to the state. But the arrow's direction in the narrow corridor looks in a very different direction. It goes up where both of them are getting empowered. So that was what I was trying to capture the, uh, with the previous two pictures, people organizing and as a result, the state having to take on more responsibilities. That's one aspect of the arrows pointing further up toward the northeast, greater empowerment of the state and society. But even more importantly, there is an element of race here meaning that here the state is going to try to uh, impose its will further, and society will have to develop new ways of controlling the state or controlling the elites uh, that are in charge of the state. And that is what we mean by the Red Queen. So what underlies the sort of upward-looking trajectory there is that both state and society are locked in an ongoing competition. And in this competition, just like in Alice in Wonderland's Red Queen, both sides have to fa run fast because what matters is your relative position. If you don't run as fast as you can, then you're going to fall behind. And if you fall behind, you won't be in the narrow corridor. You will be spinning out of it. I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the talk. Not an unimportant problem, but I just won't have too much time about it. But so you have to run very fast to maintain your relative position. But in contrast to Alice in Wonderland, the uh, so Red Queen, this Red Queen is not completely wasteful because as a result, the relative position of the state and society remain sort of balanced. But as, uh, as a result of that process, they're both getting more empowered. So that's what I'm going to try to sort of explain. Of course, huge numbers of uh, uh, abstractions here in representing this picture. Society, that's a nebulous concept. So uh, I'm going to use it to essentially mean non-elites, people who are not politicians, powerful bureaucrats, you know, Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffett, just regular people. And of course, society is not a monolithic entity. There are huge numbers of conflicts, and those conflicts are very important. And I'll come back to some of those, but you know, uh, let's start here. By power of society, essentially, I mean especially norms and institutions against political hierarchy or controlling political hierarchy. So there is some aspects of bottom-up mobilization, some aspects of norms, which I'll talk about with some examples in a second. But we'll see that the institutionalization of this power of society is actually one of the key things that a lot of this will turn around uh, on. State, state, state institutions and elites that control them. And, uh, and, and I've said already a lot about that. But one thing is that that power of the state is intimately linked with the capacity of the state to get things done. So in particular, going back to this figure, you know, 
one of the things that we try to understand is where exactly you are here. You can have states that are despotic in here, or you can have states that are despotic up there towards the, the top of the figure, like China, and those have very different implications. So I sort of introduced this conceptual framework, but there are some questions that might already be in your minds. Not that I can answer all of them, but one that I think is rather important, and I'll just uh, go ahead and, and, and mention uh, right away, is why is it that anybody would remain without a Leviathan? So if you are a uh, society here, why not try to engineer a move into the corridor? Now, one possibility is that you know, you just cannot because there is the ISIS there with their, uh, uh, with their weapons and anything you try to do, they'll chop your head or hands. But there is a uh, complementary and perhaps even deeper reason, which we're going to call slippery slope, fear of political hierarchy. So there is a con con constant fear in many societies and especially in societies before sort of uh, powerful proto-states have emerged that any type of political hierarchy is going to be a first step towards some type of despotism. And a lot of the norms of these small group societies are actually evolved around this sort of fear of political hierarchy or fear of slippery slope. So one example, and again, uh, a, 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 a nice animation, is uh, from, the, from the TIV. So the Tiv, uh, who live in this part of Nigeria, it's actually a very large area, uh, are a uh, very useful uh, society for us because they're one of the surviving stateless societies. Not so small scale, actually. Tivland is a huge area. And, uh, and, uh, and we know a lot about them because a, uh, a husband and wife team of anthropologists, uh, the Bohanons, uh, lived with them for over a decade and wrote extensively on them and summarized both their views and the oral histories of the TIV. From what we know, uh, from what anthropologists know, the TIV are quite representative of at least surviving stateless societies. And, uh, and the thing that's interesting about the TIV is that all of the social norms that at first look very strange, like for example their, uh, their beliefs in different types of witchcraft, all turn around political hierarchy. So uh, in particular, a lot of the witchcraft is directed against people who become very powerful. In, uh, the, in the Tiv language, for example, the word for power, Tsav, is related to, uh, to witchcraft, to the uh, witches that gather for nefarious purposes, drinking the blood of people and getting powerful through that channel. And so any type of power, any type of political hierarchy is generally viewed as nefarious, as, as obtained through nefarious means. And, uh, and, and uh, witchcraft is one of the many different types of norm-based organizations that get people to sort of stamp out that type of political hierarchy. So men who had acquired too much power were whittled down by means of witchcraft accusations. So it's a very, very common thing in Tiv society. So that's just one illustration of why it's very difficult for, uh, a, for any type of political hierarchy to emerge. And if we don't have the political hierarchy, moving into the corridor, of course, is well nigh impossible. But of course, there are certain structural characteristics of the Tiv, which I'll come back to in a second. Uh, or many other stateless societies, which make it uh, sort of an equilibrium for this sort of configuration, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Or if I have time, I'll talk about that. I don't know. We'll see. Now, this, as I said, is a very common sort of thing among many different types of societies. And I mentioned stateless societies, but stateless societies are not the only ones that have the uh, fear of political hierarchy. 
In fact, one of the very interesting societies which we discuss uh, at length in the book is ancient Athens. But what distinguishes ancient Athens from, from the TIF is they're very much one of the first examples of a society not only that uh, was in the corridor, but actually evolved for uh, several hundreds of years in the corridor. But one of the things that the Athenians had, going back to the days before Solon, uh, who started this uh, uh, process of reform, was a similar unease with political hierarchy. So one of the very interesting reforms that Cleisthenes, uh, about 100 years after Solon's initial reforms, brought in was the ostracism law. And the ostracism law uh, has, has essentially went like uh, that every, uh, every year people would get to write the name of a person on pieces of broken shard, ostracon, that's where the word ostracism comes from. And then depending on whose name it was written, if enough of these names were written by Athenian citizens, the, uh, uh, the parliament would have a decision whether that person would be ostracized or not. This is from the, uh, os uh, from the ostracism of Themistocles, who if uh, anybody comes close to a complete hero is, is him, because he twice saved Athens from Persians and uh, was uh, very forward looking in terms of both the both the threat from Persia and later from, threat, uh, from Sparta. He spearheaded the navy, which saved the Athenians from uh, the Persians and then actually led it. But he was getting too big for his britches, and so he was ostracized. So, but while you see the parallel with the fear of political hierarchy that the Tiv had, the way that the Athenians dealt with it is very different. And it, the difference is sort of useful for understanding the Red Queen effect and the corridor is that while the TIV not having the institutions and not having the bottom-up social organization, and in particular just locked into their specific types of norms, could not uh, envisage and could not even handle the emergence of political hierarchy, the Athenians managed to sort of develop this uh, 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 this, uh, this distrust of power but institutionalize it. What's amazing about the ostracism law, uh, you know, from 12, uh, you know, uh, 2,400 years ago, or the previous law that Solon passed, the hubris law, is that they institutionalize different types of controls over behavior of elites. So the hubris law that Solon passed actually made it a capital offense for the elites to behave hubristically uh, towards uh, other people, including slaves. And so this institutionalization is the essence of the Red Queen effect, that you're allowing the elites, so like Themistocles, like Cleisthenes himself, who came from very powerful families and be, uh, came to play very important financial and economic and political roles, to actually have a long leash in doing that. So you allow political hierarchy, but you use the institutions and you strengthen, continuously strengthen the institutions in order to be able to better control them as they themselves become more powerful. And in fact, during this period, you have huge uh, expansion of the state, you know, something that's unthinkable, you know, circuit court judges, roads, an orphanage system, social security system, money, uh, a huge road building program, state-run prisons, and all sorts of things that we, you know, wouldn't assist, associate with things that happened 2,500 years ago, but that sort of state capacity building happens under the watch of society, which is the better solution for shackling the Leviathan than the doppelganger solution that I talked about. Okay. So the other question is that if you look at this picture here, what you see is that ultimately the capacity of the state is going to much higher levels, or at least higher levels, in the corridor than in the despotic Leviathan region. So what that means is that, contrary to what you read every day in newspapers, this theory claims, so either it's completely wrong or there's some truth to it, but we'll see. This theory claims that it's not that China is the paragon of great state capacity and, uh, and, 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 uh, and places like the UK and the US are, are falling and they should imitate uh, 
China in order to get things done, is that ultimately the deeper form of state capacity evolves in, thanks to this Red Queen effect. So why is that? Well, the reason is exactly what I've already talked about. It's the fact that society gives its consent to the expansion of power of the society, that, of the state, that's so important. So deeper form of state capacity, which require monitoring of the state, cooperation of monitoring of the state by society, monitoring, uh, sorry, uh, cooperation of society, are going to be very difficult to evolve under the despotic form of the state. So you see that in the Chinese case, for example, the great difficulties of being able to control judges or control uh, control the corruption process. And, uh, and, 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 and any type of uh, quality control uh, or even the ability to measure uh, GDP or other types of activities in China are actually, despite the appearance of state capacity, we argue are actually weaknesses of state capacity. So what I'm going to do during the rest, the, the remaining little time, I'm going to give a little bit more of a historical outline to put a little bit of flesh on the bones of this particular theory. So I'll talk a little bit about Europe. Why is it that many of the examples of these shackled Leviathan have evolved in Europe? Why not China? So I'll talk about the effects of uh, what we economists call comparative statics when you change structural factors like the economy, politics, globalization. How does that impact things? And uh, how to move into the corridor and how to stay in the corridor. So I'll end a little bit on that. So what was special about Europe? Uh, must be something special if you have this constellation of shackled-looking places from England to uh, parts of Germany, France, uh, the Dutch, and so on and so forth. Well, we argue it's not geography, it's not Greco-Roman culture, it's not Christianity, it's not Roman institutions, and et cetera, et cetera. All of these have been proposed by many thinkers and uh, historians and political scientists. But it is a combination of two things, the Roman and the Germanic tribal institutions. So in particular, one thing that's very distinctive about the Germanic tribes that came to invade much of Europe was actually not completely distinctive. There are other tribal societies that have similar things, but, but, but not all tribal societies. Mongols don't seem to have had them, for example, or the, uh, or the Arabs. But, but the Germanic war bands especially the Franks that played a defining role in Europe after the fall of the, uh, uh, of the Western Roman Empire, were assemblies. So they had various different types of assemblies that had real power. That they, they were not just rubber, rubber stamping actions by the leaders, but they actually made decisions and they elected leaders quite frequently. And approvals was necessary uh, for many important decisions. And there were two kinds of assemblies that played an important role, one by elites, but the other one by regular people. And they both met commonly. So this is noted by Tacitus. Uh, not everything Tacitus writes is, uh, is reliable, but this seems to be reliable because it's sort of confirmed later. It's, uh, as, uh, actually, Julius Caesar also confirms that, not that he's reliable either. But, uh, but, 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 but from 100 year, uh, BC, over matters of minor importance, only the chiefs debate on major affairs, the whole community. And, he, and, and he, explains, he goes on to explain these assemblies. So the same thing is repeated in a book that uh, Hinkmar of Reims writes after, uh, uh, after the heyday of the Carolingian Empire as giving advice to uh, the new book, the new king being, uh, being crowned. And, and he says it's very important to follow this custom uh, they, you have to have these two assemblies uh, for important men and, uh, and, and those of lower situations who have to be present in, in other assemblies. So it's very similar to what Tacitus describes. And a lot of things, both from the Carolingians and, uh, and the earlier Merovingians, especially the Merovingians, actually conf uh, confirms the importance of these assemblies. The other, other blade of that particular like scissor looking like uh, uh, corridor are the institutions of the Roman Western Roman Empire. Though the uh, empire collapses and certain parts of the institutional legacy of it disappears, quite a bit of it remains. And the, and the Merovingians, especially Clovis, actually takes them over and marries them with the, with the assemblies of, uh, of, 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 the, of the Germanic tribes. And, 
so let me not go to the, to the details of that. But what's sort of interesting, and this is again sort of uh, a useful point to bear in mind, you see <coughs> this in, in several points in, uh, in, in early uh, uh, European history and then later European history. Law making is very different inside the corridor than in the despotic parts of the corridor. I mean, despotic parts of the, of the space that I outline. So in the despotic part, and China again being an example, which I'll talk to briefly in a second, laws are imposed from above in order to control certain types of behavior. A lot of the laws that evolved during this period, at least on surface, but actually also deeply, are presented and developed as wishes of society. So that's true for, like, for example, the Athenian laws. So I mentioned the hubris law that Solon passed. Well, the hubris law did not come up with from a, uh, the brilliant genius of Solon, though he probably was a very smart man. Actually, hubris law institutionalized the practice that was, uh, that was in society and uh, was practiced at a smaller scale. So this is the way that many of the laws of the, uh, this crucial period uh, this, uh, were, 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 were passed. So for example, this is from the uh, Salic laws that, that Clovis passed. And they're actually presented not as laws that Clovis himself imposes, although he was a very powerful king, but as laws that for lawgivers from society brought. And he was the implementer of these laws, not the designer or the, or the, uh, or the powerful agent of it. Uh, so you see the same thing uh, in, in, in England. Uh, England uh, is sort of uh, populated later by Anglo Saxons, and Jutes, which are the sort of the descendants of the Franks. And, and you see exactly the same assemblies, the same sort of things. And in England, those get called uh, the Witans. And they play a very, very important role, and uh, even more important than role than on the continent because they get to select a lot of kings. So during the first uh, uh, several centuries of England, uh, uh, you know, the majority of kings are actually selected by the Witans for, the, for a variety of reasons. And uh, so this is from uh, no man can make himself king, but the people has to choose who is king. So again, you see the power of the assemblies. The kingship is becoming more powerful, especially in war during this period, but the uh, power of the assemblies remain. And that sort of survives the Norman invasion. Let me not get into that. Uh, and, uh, and the Magna Carta, you know, its importance is sometimes debated. And uh, I think it just has to be viewed as a step in this longer process. But what's sort of interesting is that it's passed in Ramimid, and Ramimid is the is actually uh, comes from the word mitan. It's the meadow, meadow of the witan. So its symbolic place is a continuation of this tradition of the of the assemblies. So you have this uh, you have this sort of state building process. So you have the uh, capacity of the state getting stronger over this uh, over this process. But actually, what's interesting is that you know the standard historiography sometimes presents this as you know uh, you know some powerful kings like Henry the Seventh and Henry the Eighth, perhaps uh, Elizabeth uh, sort of uh, expanded the reach of the state and uh, its monopoly over violence. Well, there is a little bit of truth to that, but it's just a little bit. A lot of the state building during this crucial period, as before, comes actually from society. So a lot of it comes from bottom-up processes where people, just regular people, as in Wiltshire, uh, which is described by Stephen Hindle in, uh, in, uh, in, in a village called Swallowfield, people who are not even taxpayers, by the way, so they're not rich enough to be taxpayers, they get together and they, they start local state building projects, which are then sometimes supported by the central state, sometimes not. But, but it's sort of this bottom-up process that's actually the instigator to it, a lot of the expansion of the state. And uh, so let me sort of uh, skip the next part, which is more about how this sort of evolves in the 18th and the 19th centuries. But just to underscore that it is actually the interaction of these two particular blades, the Germanic institutions and the Roman institutions that are important for shaping the corridor for Europe and a lot of the, a lot of the different parts of Europe is to actually contrast it to parts of Europe where one of these two blades did not exist. So Iceland, which was too far and did not have any sort of uh, hallmark of uh, 
uh, or fingerprint of the German uh, of, of the Roman institutions, but was colonized by uh, by by early on by by Germanic tribes, has the assemblies, but they never coalesce into state institutions. So after a while, the assemblies are continuing, but a continuous type of feuding develops in Iceland, where in the absence of the state, you have sort of something perhaps not as bad as Syria or Iraq, but, but something quite distinctive in terms of constant fighting and no political development and nothing looking like liberty. Uh, Byzantium is the other interesting case because it's actually the direct continuation of Roman institutions, but it has no effects of the uh, Germanic, uh, Frankish uh, uh, assemblies, institutions, and practices and of course, it develops one of the most famous types of despotisms and, uh, and, and, and no sort of uh, political mobilization or participation of society. So uh, this actually, the Byz Byzantian model is not so different from China. You know, Chinese history is very complicated. Neither Jim nor I are experts on it. But if you go back in time during the spring and autumn period between the 8th and 4th centuries BC, you have things that look like assemblies in parts of China. But during this warring state periods, uh, things get pretty uh, hairy. And then you have the rise of the Qin state. And, uh, and that sort of stamps out all of these assemblies. And uh, Qin state develops a, a very despotic type of governance, uh, captured very well by the uh, legalism philosophy of Shang Yang or Lord Shang. And uh, this is this uh, gentleman. So when the people are weak, the state is strong. Hence, the state that possesses the way strives to weaken the people. So that's very much what I was talking about in the despotic case, which is that statecraft is really, in, in the views of Lord Shang, which were very influential in, in how uh, state institutions evolved uh, w you know, for several centuries and, and, and even beyond was all about states weakening the state. So that, of course, is a, uh, is a recipe for not being in the corridor. Uh, and there are many interesting parts of Chinese history, which we try to go in the book, but I'm not going to talk about, because there are waves of uh, different types of developments, as in the Song and the Tang period, for example. But, uh, but, but all of it takes under sort of the despotic control of the state. Uh, so this has various implications for economics, uh, which uh, let me sort of not get so much into in the interest of time. But you know, if you have a state, and in history there are many examples of it, Byzantium again included, China both in the past and today at times, you have this despotic growth where the capacity of the state enables this type of growth. But it is a very different type of growth than the one that happens in the corridor. And again, the, the key is about the relationship between state and society. So the other thing I want to talk about is about what factors determine whether you are or are not able to develop state capacity. So one famous thesis uh, in political science, for example, is by Charles Tilley, as captured by his pithy saying, states made war and more war made state, is that if you have war pressure, states are going to build capacity, as he uses the example of Prussia, uh, or, 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 or Peter the Great, and so on. That's one of many structural factors that people have suggested. You know. Uh, need for state action, like with Fogel, like hydraulic societies, certain types of crops, globalization, and so on and so forth. And all of those are interesting ideas. But the conundrum in this particular literature, which is huge, is that for every example, you have a counterexample, or many counterexamples. For every case in which war made state, in fact, as Charles Tilly claimed, there is a counterexample where war destroyed the state or the pressure for war led to a very different type of dynamics. So, uh, <clears throat> so this particular conceptual framework actually helps us explain. So if state capacity develops most strongly inside the corridor, then the effects of structural factors, which loosely speaking can be thought of as 
changing your position in this picture uh, are going to be completely dependent on where you are in the picture. So if you are, like Switzerland, start with a situation where the confederation, uh, the, the, the Swiss cantons are strong and there are strong norms and organization and the confederation is non-existent, you know, the pressure for war, which were very strongly felt during that time, uh, is going to be an impetus for you to move into the corridor. But if you're like the Holy Roman Empire, uh, pressure under the Frederick the Great, you know, greater pressure for war actually can get you, can in, induce you to build even further state capacity, which is what uh, uh, Frederick Willem was able to do very successfully. But that can get you out of the corridor rather than into the corridor. So in particular, all sorts of changes in structural factors are going to have effects that are very much conditional on when you, where you are. The same changes can get you into the corridor or out of the corridor. So therefore, you get a very different picture of, of what happens. So, so what matters? Does anything matter? Well, one set of things matter, and I think there are various different issues to discuss about moving into the corridor, for which I don't have time here. We, uh, some of this, I don't, we don't even have time in the book. But, but, but today, just the one thing that I want to emphasize is that a crucial thing is how narrow is that corridor. I said it's a narrow corridor, but how narrow? Well, take these two cases. Here it's really narrow. Here it's wider. So if it's wider, it's easier to get into. And once you get into, it's harder to get dislodged away from it. So structural factors that make this, the corridor less or more narrow, therefore, are the important ones. So very crucially, for example, this is not a teleological theory which says, oh, you know, everything is going to work towards some sort of end of history, or every country is going to move towards a kind of a democratic type of thing. But still, we do know that democracy is much more common, not that democracy is the same as shackling, look at Turkey, look at Venezuela, but, uh, but, but there is something that sort of uh, makes shackling more, more feasible in the recent, say, 100 years than before. So one of the things that in the context, uh, conceptual framework can explain there is that over time, the corridor will become wider rather than narrower. So what are the factors? So we go through a couple of them, but I think one very important one is presence or absence of labor coercion. So if you look at a lot of economic relations, even, by the way, in stateless societies, they're based on labor coercion. And labor coercion turns politics much more polarized and, uh, and, and, and the power of the state much more used for destroying any kinds of opposition to it. So absence or gradual disappearance of labor coercion in various forms uh, actually makes the corridor broader. So for example, the reason why similar pressures may have no chance of leading South Africa towards a uh, uh, non-racial regime in the beginning of the 20th century, you know, in the, towards the end of the 20th century, similar uh, uh, things led to the apart or end of the apartheid regime. I don't think they are completely unrelated to the fact that labor coercion had completely uh, had not completely, but had largely subsided in, in South Africa uh, 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 by, <clears throat> by, by uh, especially after, uh, after 1984, the removal of the color bar and, uh, and the organization of the trade unions. So the final thing, I'll say a few words about staying in the corridor, because perhaps it's actually uh, related to, in the interests of some of the people in this room, I don't know, because I'm going to relate it to Hayek. You know, of course, everybody here is, uh, is, is familiar uh, with The Road to Serfdom, one of the uh, very important books uh, of social science and philosophy at some level. Well, uh, you probably also know that Road to Serfdom was a reaction that, uh, from Hayek to the Beveridge Report of uh, 1942. Uh, so the Beveridge reform, uh, Report in the middle of the war sort of called for, and actually successfully called for, a huge expansion of the social welfare state. Uh, it had already started in the 1930s, but it really gained force after the beverage reform. So James Griffith, for example, the, uh, the minister 
uh, for labor after the uh, after the after the war says in one of the darkest hours of the war in 1942 the beverage before film like manna from heaven it sort of mobilized very different segments of society and people sort of uh, uh, moved around the beverage reform. Hayek disagreed. He thought it was a terrible idea. And the reason why he thought it was a terrible idea actually has some traces of what we're talking about. He thought that the beverage report and a lot of the things would bring the administrative state, and the administrative state would be too strong for society to contend with it, and you would go to serfdom. So the road to serfdom was really about England. It wasn't really about Russia. Uh, this means, among other things, that even a strong tradition of political liberty, he wrote, is no safeguard if the danger is precisely that new institutions and policies will gradually undermine and destroy that spirit. So there is a lot of sort of parallel with, between what Hayek is saying and, and what we are saying at some, at some level. But with one crucial difference. I think Hayek was mistaken. And the reason why he was mistaken and why beverage reform and similar things that happened in many different parts of Europe, especially in Nordic countries, but, but also in other parts, was, <clears throat> was not the doom of some sort of democratic or shackled leviathan, was the Red Queen effect. What, you know, if there is no Red Queen effect, the only way you can maintain a balance between the society of the administration, that's what he was especially afraid of, and the power of political uh, action by non-elites is by weakening the administration, weakening the state. But in the in the, that's in the absence of the Red Queen effect. In the presence of the Red Queen effect, though, what you can have is that the state gets stronger and society gets stronger in response, and that will keep the balance. And that's exactly what happened in Scandinavia. That's exactly what happened in Britain. You know, not in a uh, completely smooth fashion, you know, sometimes the state, the administration get got too strong, and then society had to react, and so on and so forth. There were backs and forths, uh, but but that that was sort of crucial. And uh, and and the Swedish case is actually particularly interesting because it shows how new coalitions form in order to further strengthen society. Uh, for example, how businesses were brought into the cow trade. That was the uh, uh, was the sort of the critical thing that formed the, the basis of the Swedish uh, political system. And then when the, when the trade unions got too strong, how uh, <coughs> the reaction to it further weakened the trade unions and, uh, and reversed some policies and so on and so forth. So therefore, what I want to say is that in, in, in conclusion is that I think this contrast with a world in which the Red Queen effect is present and is not is rather important because one way of thinking about the world, again, abstract and simple, is one in which there are new exigencies, new challenges that are coming all the time. And one way of dealing with these challenges, it, every one of them, is you try to find an ad hoc, local, decentralized way of dealing with it. Uh, that's a little bit the American way, by the way, and we try to trace the history of American institutions with a new interpretation to explain why that might have been. But another way is to say, and, and, and that, that is like a Hayekian concern at the bottom of it, is, well, we don't want the federal government to become too strong. An alternative way is to say, well, the heck with it. It's the Chinese solution. There are new challenges, and to deal with that, you're going to have to make the state strong. Anything that stands on the way of the state uh, has to be weakened. That's the Lord Shang's uh, to strive to weaken society. But the Red Queen effect says there is a third way, which is that you let the state take on more responsibilities. Okay? You have globalization. Globalization creates new risks, new distributional concerns. You let the state redistribute more. But at the same time, you have to strengthen society precisely in the way that can withstand those specific strengthening of the state so that you don't go Hayek's uh, road to serfdom way. So it's not, it, it's not a silver bullet, easier said than done, but I think that's a slightly different way of thinking about how policy should be made. Policy is not just a technocratic problem. Policy is a social problem because it needs to be... Uh, accompanied by societal changes, institutionalized changes, to deal precisely with the increasing power of the state as we ask it to take on more responsibilities. Let me stop there and, uh, and take some questions. Thank you. Yeah. Oh.
Any questions? <laughs> okay, let me start in the back with you. Yeah. Oh, there's a microphone coming. Yeah. Uh, please raise your hands. I'll write down a few names. Okay. Got it. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for that. I enjoyed it uh, a great deal. It seems like there's two notions of power you've got kicking around. One is a sort of domination, uh, and that's a zero-sum game. So that can't be the case that as the power of the state increases, the power of the people increases. That's, it's, uh, that's not going to happen. So the other notion of power you're knocking around with seems to be something like ability, where, of course, um, if you enhance the ability of the, of the state, give it more resources, it can do things that couldn't do before, and it, that's quite consistent with uh, the wider society having also enhanced ability and you can move forward on that basis. So then the interesting question becomes, what's the relationship between power and the sense of domination? Um, do you want a kind of equilibrium between the state and the, and the wider society to enable this, um, as we might say in this conference, joint action <laughs> on the part of the, uh, the state and the society? Um, and I think that feeds into some of your other points. For example, you would expect that coercive labour would be highly problematic because it's, it's stymieing the ability of, uh, of people in the wider society to, uh, to work to, w with the state. Thank you. Yeah, that's very important. And uh, I think there are many dif there are several different types of uh, powers and cap capabilities of the state. You know, the ability of the state to, for example, adjudicate disputes is rather different from its ability to send the police and uh, kick you on the head. But I think fundamentally, this is a belief which we try to sort of uh, uh, undergird in the book, but fundamentally, different types of powers, especially on the axes that you have indicated, are not completely separable. You cannot have the state be very powerful in solving problems like, you know, uh, dealing with disputes, and while at the same time, say that power is not going to be used for dominating society. So that's why our sort of thing is that the balance has to be guaranteed not by weakening certain dimensions of the power, but by matching that power of the state with a different type of power of society to withstand those challenges. So that's right, I think those different capacities have to be distinguished quite right, but, but I think they are also inseparable in some way. Okay. Next question there in the back. Um, I was wondering about the strong contrast between uh, the state and society. Uh, another explanation might be that there are uh, different classes within society and that some of those classes will peer with the state to oppress the other classes. Uh, and then at other points that empowered class will act as a check and balance against the state. Uh, but that will fluctuate and there will always be, or often there will be a disenfranchised class. Uh, that's right. Uh, I think the, uh, the sort of the simplification with state and society is, is, is simplified. Uh, and that's why I was sort of saying by the state I mean the elites included. So, so in some cases you would want to sort of uh, identify certain uh, groups in society with the state. So if you think about feudal Europe, you cannot think of the state without you know, the most powerful lords. You know, there is conflict between those lords, between the lord and the king, for example, but that's part of it. But, uh, but at other times, you're right, there are other conflicts within society that are very important. For example, you know, if you look at you know, US South for most of its history, you have you know, whites uh, ganging up with local government to repress blacks. But, but again, I think uh, the sort of the distinction between overall society or some mobilized segments of that society and the state is a useful organizing framework or so we think. So in particular, in many of the examples that, that I have given, I think it's not really about class conflict in any uh, well-defined form, but it's really about state uh, and those who control the state and its institutions versus uh, particular types of organization of society. Helena? Um, I also was 
going along very well, happily with your framework, until you started to talk about the TIV. And so I will take uh, your email, if I may, with your permission. Please. Because you need, I think, if I may be so uh, rude, there's, there's a huge gap here in the idea of there being stateless societies. Um, this is a function of a um, <clears throat> 50 years old uh, anthropological framework, which is simply inadequate to understand an uh, alternative way of leadership and political uh, structure and formation. What's going on in these societies, I can't speak to TIV directly, but in, throughout northern Ghana, you have places and uh, polities which are regarded as stateless from a Eurocentric standpoint. But the reason the, the political structure there is invisible is because there's a fundamental difference in the relationship of state to society. In other words, there is a seamless relation between those who lead the political people in, in power and those who are representative of the community, the families, the clans. And what you have in these situations is a very intricate, very sophisticated, uh, very well-formed uh, political structure of governance, highly capable so that people are trained in a, in a long tradition, very strictly and rigorously for very many years, learning, the leaders learn uh, traditions of leadership, medical practice, art, religion, physics, botany, agriculture, but their knowledge traditions are totally differently organized than yours and mine, so we don't see it. But in, in terms of capacity, you have m medical healers who are also leading their society. The, the capability is beyond our recognition this is people who have absolutely nothing, but their leaders have been taking care of them, keeping everybody alive, resolving conflict and so on for generations. And they also take care of other communities outside their own. So I just look forward to giving you, rec recommend, you know, recommended readings of people who've been doing work on African history and political culture. So that'll help elaborate your, your conceptual framework. Thank you. Thank you, I'll look forward to uh, receiving those references. but. Uh, but, you know, I mean, the TIV have chiefs, too. And uh, exactly like you say, those chiefs are very much empowered by tradition. And what the implications of that are, at least so far as we understand, is that their powers are also greatly limited. So, in particular, uh, and there, there's a lot of uh, var variation there, but in many of these societies, I think, especially the ones in Papua New Guinea, are a little bit better uh, studied in this respect, although more recently perhaps the African uh, ones uh, beyond the TIV are also better understood. You know, the ability of these chiefs to, in particular, control violence is very, very limited. So you have... Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so can I see hands again? Kurt Lobwick has the next question. Can I see hands again? Okay. okay, thank you. So I wanted to ask also a question about the, the way you've uh, framed the narrow path to liberty. Uh, so I, like Seamus, I had a question about the power of the state because it looks like that's always relativized to some kind of task the state can undertake. So there are lots of different dimensions of that, and they can vary across types of society. And maybe the power society restricts state powers in certain ways. For example, being able to make quick decisions. Centralizing power helps. Distributing uh, decision-making uh, hinders that. So it, it seems to me it's like multidimensional, and it's very difficult to represent it in a single graph like this. The other thing I was kind of worried about uh, or concerned about is it's a concept of power society uh, when you represent it in this way with two orthogonal uh, di um, um, dimensions, uh, you're treating power society as something that is independent of state power. But it's not clear to me that as we think about its manifestations in different kinds of states, that it really is independent that way. So some forms of power society couldn't even exist except in the context of a state. And some forms of power society are built into the institution state, as in the case of representative democracies. So um, I'm worried that this way of you know, trying to you know, depict it 
graphically as misrepresenting some of the relations between the two things that you're trying to keep track of. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely multidimensional, uh, but, you know, <clears throat> I, I find simplification useful as a way of sometimes thinking through complicated things. Some other people may not, may find it one simplification too many. But let me uh, take up the second part of your comment, because I think that's absolutely true. But, you know, it's absolutely true because it's in, in this figure, actually, that you cannot have the power of the society really evolve when the state is weak. Because, you know, what is the power of society? As I mentioned, it's all about institutionalization. We cannot have that institutionalization. So I said I would come back why you couldn't have sort of easy movements into the corridor, and I didn't really have time to. You know, unless you have the, uh, the, the, the state there, institutionalization is not going to be feasible. So in particular, you know, uh, again, you know, going back to the TIV, you have these norms against political hierarchy, but what are those norms against political hierarchy once political hierarchy emerges? So you have several examples of powerful leaders that come in the middle of, the, uh, of, these, of these norms. For example, the most interesting one being Shaka Zulu. You know, there are similar norms among the Zulus, but as soon as he emerges as a powerful guy, he sort of subdues the norms. So he, he makes the... Uh, uh, you know, he, he makes the sort of the equivalent of the religious leaders now subjugated to himself, threatens them, and from then on, he has the power to say who engages in witchcraft and who doesn't. So, so that's that's the problem with these sort of decentralized, norm-based ones. Once you go to a greater power of the state, then you can have much greater, of course. Then you can have people participating in assemblies or. Or, or, or gatherings, or in the extreme vote. So those are all dependent on the institutional fabric being there, so it wouldn't be able to, to get off the ground in every society. So that's why you know, these arrows are not pointing in just like random direction, that it is in the corridor that, that, that power of the society is, is evolving. So that's what this is trying to capture. Cynthia, your, your question. Um, yeah, I'm Cynthia Stark. Um, this is kind of a speculative question, but I just wanted to hear your comment on it. So it struck me that the societies that you identified that are within the corridor and have that magical combination of Germanic and Roman institutional histories. Some of them. I, those are not the only ones in the corridor. But sure. I should have um, that, right? We're also places um, in which the, um, the theory of the social contract arose. And it struck me that um, maybe uh, the idea of the social contract, which is basically the idea that the government's power extends no further than what individuals would agree to have the government's power be, might be a kind of um, philosophical or maybe ideological, if you prefer, justification for shackling. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's a very, very important point. You know, you cannot have the idea of the social contracts, and you do not have the idea of the social contract in China. During reformist periods in China, you have the mandate of heaven. You know, the mandate of heaven says, you know, the, uh, the ruler has to, be, to behave nice. So ethical ruler, that's the sort of Confucian. The ethical ruler is the ruler that has all the power. So the Confucian philosophy doesn't constrain the ruler, doesn't take away power from him, but asks him to ask in a moral way. So you never have the social contract. The social contract itself is something that really requires organization of society so that society can be a, uh, a seat of power. But once you have that idea of social contract, of course, that's just like the norms that I was trying to talk about, it then enables people to organize around it. So you couldn't have some of the early sort of the democratization attempts without some sort of idea of social contract. So I think that's exactly the sort of the process of the, what we're trying to capture with the Red Queen. So yes, absolutely, thank you. Scott Shapiro. Um, so I, I wanted to ask about what, what is in that corridor. I mean, it's supposed to be a space of liberty and non-despotism. It's funny because if you had asked me to name one society that would have been th the least despotic, I would, have th I would have said Iceland, the medieval Iceland. I mean, that's medieval Iceland, so much of the scholarship about it has emerged because it, 
it, libertarians thought of it as a fantasy land that, look, this thing existed, um, and we, you know, maybe we can go back there um, uh, and have a, have, have, a, have a society more like them. Now, you mentioned the thing about the feuds, yes. but the way you present it, and I know you're presenting so much here, so you, it, 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 perhaps um, you qualify it, in, in, in the book, but it, you made it sound as if the feuds were a result of the absence of the state, but it's the other way around. They, they, don't have, they didn't have a state because they wanted to have the feuds. That is, they, they, the, it was a society that had fled um, basically Denmark um, and, want, and, and, um, and did not have a rigid class structure and um, thought that every it was the power of every freeholder to take to 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 exercise their rights. Um, by contrast, if you said to me, "What's the most despotic, you know, um, societies?" I would have thought European, in the sense of the rigid class structures. May uh, you know, f first feudalism and then um, the the remnants of it made social mobility incredibly difficult. Um, and then, of course, there's g classical Athens and, um, and Rome, where you have slavery, um, uh, you have antebellum United States. So I, 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 it's hard, it's hard to, for me to kind of get a grip on exactly what is this liberty that's in this corridor when things kind of don't map on to how I would yeah, there are many aspects of the questions you're asking, and, and I don't know whether I can give completely satisfactory answers to some of them. Uh, but let me sort of clarify one thing. So I don't mean to say that you know, once you enter the corridor, let's say that let's take that point, there is liberty there. Far from it. That's the situation where the state is weak, society is weak, nothing works. And in fact, if you look at the historiography, uh, there is a huge amount of violence. So you wouldn't want to live with the Merovingians. It is that liberty evolves as an outcome of that process up at, at, up at the very top. So the corridor is not where the liberty is present all the time, but the conditions for liberty evolve over time. So that's, I should have made that clear, and that's very, very important. The second point is I didn't have time to, you know, not everything that you think should be in the book is in the book, and, and our understanding of history is at best, you know, limited in many cases. But one thing that is in the book is, you know, uh, how difficult it is to evolve in the corridor, and that's because of outside influences, and this balance is actually a precarious one. You know, if you and I are in a tennis match, a balance is like, a small difference between our scores, that's very difficult to maintain even if we are matched in power. So you have ups and downs all the time. So our interpretation, actually that was in the slides, but I didn't, interp I didn't have time to talk about it, is that you know, uh, the Norman invasion in England, for example, which brings feudalism, is very much a weakening of society at the expense of the elites. You know, relative to what was there before, the Norman invasion weakens the assemblies, uh, imposes this feudal order, much more rigid structure. But somehow the assemblies survive. The Witans com don't completely disappear. And especially with Henry II, when he sort of uh, tries to start the next phase of the state building, he has to turn to them for approval. So, so, so the feudalism doesn't completely obliterate these things and then they sort of resurface. So that's the way that we've, but there are other instances and especially in continental Europe that completely gets uh, uh, obliterated. So France, <coughs> the land of the Franks, where you would expect, but there feudalism becomes stronger without the, uh, the intervening forces and then and, 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 and there's much, much delays. On Iceland, I think that's actually an important point. I'm not going to uh, get into all of the details of Iceland history, but feuding is actually very important. And, uh, and we may be, of course, wrong, but our interpretation is not that you know, feuding is ever a good thing. So if you look at many of these cases, feuding is always a main concern. So when you have Solon, 
uh, in, in, in ancient Athens, one of the problems he has to deal with is feuding. The Swiss Confederation, one of the main problems they have to deal with is feuding. So if you look at places where you don't have like Montenegro, Albania, the feuding is a problem. And, and feuding to us is an ultimate form of dominance. It's just like in fighting the, 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 the sort of the, the, uh, the, the rule of the strong. So it's, a, it's an extreme form of dominance. And the reason, of course, once you have feuding, that does then undercut the power of the state. So you have that in Montenegro, you have that in Iceland. But we don't interpret the feuding as a sort of a desirable state. And in the Iceland case, feuding emerges especially after sort of any type of state institutions completely atrophy. So, and, and the implications are very dire. So you're right, uh, some people sort of uh, glorify the Iceland history, but by the 18th century, the, the Icelanders are about a full 20 centimeters shorter than the Danes. There's so much underdevelopment in Iceland. Uh, as a result of this feuding and, 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 and lack of sort of state action. And as a by, the, by the 18th century, it's actually a very elite dominated society too. Uh, so, so, so it's not, I don't know the, the sort of the libertarian sort of uh, take on the Iceland, but, but it doesn't look anything like, like a place you would want to live. But, but, but I think the more important point is, is about the, the feuding. So that's very important. So controlling feuding is always a very important step in state building. And how you deal with that is, is one of the key things here. Asta, it's right here. And there's a microphone coming your way. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm probably the only Icelander in here. So. <laughs> um, so it's, so it seems to me that you're offering a differing account of what the conditions of freedom um, should be. And it's not the checks and balances account, but this other story. So the, you know, the standard interpretation of what, what led to the collapse of the Icelandic Repu old republic was that it didn't have executive power, right? So that the standard story says, you know, there's, we're not enough checks and balances. So you, you got... It did not have enough power of the state. Well, it, it's unclear what the state was at that point, right? There were these, these uh, families, and there were the Godar, and the, um, you would go to parliament, and you, uh, you would have, you know, there was parliament every summer, and you would have a judgment. Someone stole your cow, and, you know, you got a judgment, and you had to write against them, but you needed to find someone to sort of get, implement it. yeah, implement it, because there was no executive power. So, um, yeah, so by, just, just as a parenthetic, that's exactly my understanding, and our interpretation is that's because they didn't have the blueprint or the footprints of the Roman institutions, the state institutions that the Merovingians and then later other sort of Germanic tribes adopted in other parts of Europe. But, you know, that's our interpretation. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would like to see more details of that. But we're also talking about the collapse after, you know, over three centuries, right? So it's not just that it happened the same century or something like that. Yeah. Um, so the um, I want to just correct you on the point about um, the being shorter than the Danes. I mean, the... In, in 1262, uh, there was a there was a personal agreement made between the Goadar and the Norwegian king, right? And then, of course, over centuries, the the nature of royalty and, and monarchy changed, and we effectively became a colony of the Danes. So it's not you know the feuding that was doing the work there; it was being a colonized nation for centuries, right? So, yeah. Anyway, thank you. Kid Fine, do you want to ask? Um, I was a little unsure what the, the formal definition of the corridor was. As I understand you, it involves some kind of balance of power. Mm -hmm. Of course, if two people are pulling on a rope, <laughs> uh, there's a clear sense in which if the rope doesn't move, there's a balance of power because they're exerting the same kind of power on the rope. But of course, the power that the society has is the people have is quite different from the kind of power that the state has. So it's actually somewhat unclear to me what, what, what you could mean by the balance of power. It seems to me there's a kind of conceptual issue here. Perhaps there is, perhaps there isn't. But you know, the fact that the nature of two things is different 
me doesn't mean that they're not comparable. So if the power of society comes from bottom-up organizations and from norms, and the power of the state comes from bureaucratization, that doesn't mean that they're not, they cannot be compared. I, I don't know. Perhaps in social ontology they cannot be. But. Well, ideally you, would, ideally you would like to measure them, and then, then this question of, of how you compare the two measures. And of course. Just, yeah, and that, that's yeah, yeah. It's a very real issue. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, you know, quantifying all of this is not always straightforward. But, you know, over time, uh, social science has proposed various different definitions of some of these things, measurements of some of these things. None of them perfect. Uh, you know, for the economic power of the state, you know, people use, you know, tax rates or tax revenue, et cetera. None of that is very perfect. But part of the problem is exactly that it's multidimensional. And, uh, and, and, and in particular, you know, if, if as we claim, the power of society most importantly emanates from the ability of society to sort of protest, you know, that's going to be somewhat harder to put like a measure like 5% uh, of GDP, et cetera, but it's no less real. So, you know, if, if, society, if state tries to implement policies that society doesn't like and society can stop them by protesting or by voting for somebody else or by having norms that sort of undercut what the state is trying to do, that's kind of important even if we cannot put it on sort of some of the same scales as the social science literature so far has developed for measuring the power, the, 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 the power or the capacity of the state. Hi. Um, I'm also going to ask you a question about feud and particularly your characterization of feud as total domination. Mm -hmm. Um, so my understanding of feud is that where it's effective and long-standing, it's because the feud itself is a way of reigning in power. So there are internal checks to the feud, there are rules to it, it curbs violence. Um, and in places like Iceland, where feud is eventually becomes unsuccessful, um, it's not because feud itself is the problem, it's because, for example, there's too much centralization. Um, uh, and so you don't have this kind of tit-for-tat structure, you can't curb the violence. So I'm wondering, is the problem with feud really that it's the feud itself is domination, or is it the fact that since the feud is a way of reigning in violence, there's not the strong impetus for centralization? I think both. Uh, so if you look at <clears throat> many of the places where feud is, is is widespread and in different in a broadly construed way. You often have, uh, you know, bursts of violence that, that occur. So I think that's very well documented in the case of Albania and Montenegro way up to the sort of uh, the early 20th century. You have that well documented in segmentary lineage societies which have a very choreographed type of feud. But also any type of decentralized control mechanism is a form of dominance because it's the rule of the strong against the weak. So the person who has the ability to inflict more violence against you in any type of feud-like environment is going to have more control over you. But also beyond that, and, and I didn't have time to get into that, feud-like structures make individuals subject to a range of controls as part of that feuding uh, institutionalized feuding, if you want to think of it that way. So in the segmentary lineage societies, you know, it's what Ernst Geller called the tyranny of the cousins. So that's a very, very common thing. And that, of course, is a different type of dominance. But beyond that, you're absolutely right. And, and you see this in the cases that I was trying to discuss, as well as uh, some of the other ones that I didn't have time to talk about. The feud also acts as a way of stopping uh, any type of political hierarchy. So it's a sort of a self-equilibrating system. So that's very interesting in that respect. Thank you. A variable that I don't think you mentioned, but it would fit the red queen metaphor perfectly, which is the degree to which under the circumstances a state order gets 
survival advantages from broad dependence on society. So some states depend broadly on society, for example, because they can, uh, because it's the 20th century and by uh, mobilizing enormous numbers of people to fight wars, you, you win. Mm -hmm. Or because it's the 17th century and you can borrow money from your people like the Dutch Republic does instead of from a few bankers. And so you can field a better army than the Habsburgs. But there are other times when states don't seem to get um, survival advantages from broad public support. And the reason I ask this is because I'm worried that one of those times is the early 21st century. When, um, when states, because partly because war is so technological and, and expensive, but, and capital markets supply the money for, for wars rather than broad-based um, taxpayers, that, that states are less than, so that's, that's why China. Thank you, that's a great question. In fact, you know, I think uh, this is what I was trying to get to with this picture for the first part of your question. So, the Tilly's war-made state was about the military revolution. So the war technology for the military changes. In particular, you now have light weapons that you can sort of field large armies, and you need big resources to field the large armies if you're going to uh, sort of stand up to, the, to, your, uh, to your rivals. And, uh, you know, the, the Prussians learned that, uh, that lesson the hard way uh, in the early 17th century. They're trampled by the Swedes and... Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Frederick the Great says, no, this is not going to happen again. But his solution is not to rely on society. What he does is that, you know, at the time you have these quite, you know, essentially continuation of the assemblies. You have these fairly strong uh, principality bays, you know, Brandenburg and Prussian uh, parliaments. So he makes them subjugated to themselves, and then he disbands them, and then he starts restructuring agriculture, introducing military, compulsory military service, you know, essentially a form of forced labor, taking much more of the surplus from agriculture in order to finance. So it's a very, very despotic way of doing it, and it's very successful. Prussia is very successful for 300 years in, in that strategy. Switzerland's Swiss strategy is very different. They actually get people to voluntarily take part. They're both successful in terms of war fighting, but very different political trajectories as a result of that. So, so that's the sense. So in that, coming back to your question, so that will be my interpretation, the second part of your question, that will be my interpretation of the 21st century too. I don't think there is one particular way of skinning this cat, but I agree with you. There are some technological trends that really uh, make existence in the corridor much more precarious. Uh, I, I don't know about capital markets, but, but technology certainly. In particular, you know, social media, which was heralded as a democratization, I think has, has become, uh, you know, it's an arms race of a different source, and an arms race in which, you know, centralized powers have an advantage, be they the NSA or the Chinese censors. And I think that really changes things. But, but again, I, don't, I think there are probably very different ways of organizing things. One interesting example there is, again, comes from Scandinavia. You know, actually, uh, uh, the, 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 the Danes, Norwegians, and Swedes are subject to even harsher, uh, uh, eavesdropping by their sort of NSA equivalent at some level. But they don't seem to object as much. And why is it that they don't seem to object as much? Because they have a belief, and so far not completely unwarranted, that their NSA is constrained. So it will never do anything. So you know, they can, it can easily access all of their bank accounts, actually their blood type and, and all sorts of things. And their view is, that's fine. We're not worried because it's not going to misbehave. Now, the problem in the US is that we know the NSA is going to misbehave. It has misbehaved consistently, and it will continue to misbehave. So that is about different ways of skinning this cat. So I think that's the way that I would like to think about it. But that probably is not as pessimistic as what you're putting. But we'll see about that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah OK. Uh, uh, well, OK, thanks. I apologize to everyone who didn't get to ask their question. Uh, let's. Thank our speaker again before we make some announcement. Thank you, Darren. Thanks for coming.